when we met each other. I was his type <laughs> and he was my type. My friends tease me because I tend to like boyish looking guys. But not necessarily teenagers, I just mean boys. Just, I don't know, the soft, the soft features. The first thing I look at is, is her face. Broad shoulders. The chest. I will say I would like nice teeth. It's just something that I have to have. The girl has to be short. Yeah. Definitely. I like a guy with a thick eye blows. I know this is going to sound crazy, but back. If someone has a muscly back, I love it. <laughs> you know, all the shallow stuff. Personality-wise, I look for someone who uh, gets me or who I get who, who is a little off kilter because I think I am. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. They have to be brilliant. Looks are okay. Looks are nice, but they have to be brilliant. I like someone who's honest and who I can trust. Sociable but not overbearing. Definitely sense of humor and uh, charisma. Ambition. Confident and just really comfortable with themselves. And I love people who are funny and kind of outgoing, you know. Just some striking feature. In my thinking over the years, one of the first things I, I started studying was why people are attracted to other people, why they're attracted to anyone, and why to a particular person. What we've evolved over the years in our thinking is that what people want in general is to expand themselves, to have more opportunities, more knowledge, more identities, more perspective. People want to expand themselves. And so anything they do in life, whether it's in their work or their school life, or their relationships is to expand the self. But one of the most important ways we can expand the self are through relationships. Because when you enter a relationship, the other person becomes part of you. And so you not only have who you are, you have the ways of thinking, the knowledge, the perspectives, even the things the other person owns in a close relationship become yours to some extent. So there's a tremendous expansion. I've done a lot of self-exploration and I know who I am and what I want to be. And I like to surround myself with people who are like what I want to be because I just learn that much more from them. In our research on people's descriptions of falling in love, in romantic relationships, it turns out the single most common scenario is that you meet someone that's reasonably appropriate and attractive who does something to let you think that they're attracted to you. So if you meet someone who you can come to believe is attracted to you and they're reasonably appropriate and attractive, whammo. I guess when I see someone that I'm attracted to, I can't stop smiling. When I see someone who's attractive to me, I usually try and use my eyes and my body language to get their attention and get them to talk, come talk to me. I won't smile at first, but I'll make sure I look at them and they see me. And then after that, maybe if an hour goes by, like if I'm at a party or a get together, then I'll smile at them. And I'll make sure that they see me turning down other people. <laughs> Just so they could see a challenge presented to them. And maybe that's going to... Um, make them ask me out. They're going to be more enticed to ask me out. This seems to be an extraordinarily common phenomenon of someone who is reasonably appropriate and attractive doing something that we can interpret as indicating they like us. Because if they like us, it means a relationship is probable, which is, means that I can tremendously expand myself as long as the person's reasonably appropriate and attractive. Now, if you know a relationship is likely with someone, then you want the person who's most interesting. And we've done a number of studies to show this. Normally, people want someone who's similar to themselves because it's easier to form a relationship with someone who's similar. But if you know you can form a relationship, then you want someone who's as different as possible, provided it's a good difference. If you're healthy, you don't want someone who's sick. But if you're an artist, you may want a scientist. Differences are inevitable. Uh, so I guess the greatest amount of similarity you can find would be best for the basis of your relationship. I think I get along better with people who are sim more similar to me. I like to be sociable, and um, I'm very serious about my academics, so I don't think I could be with somebody who was really quiet and really didn't have any ambitions like to, you know, in academics. -wise. So probably similar. But, you know, I still find people who are different from me attractive, too. I'd like to be in a relationship with someone who's more similar than to me than different, but... Um, a little bit of difference always does good because then you complement each other. I think when I was younger, I chose people that were um, opposite of me. And now that I'm older, I realize that the attraction is there for a little while. And then you have to have a lot 
of similarities for the relationship to last. In addition to these factors of similarity and the desirability of the person, there are factors that have to do with the situation in which you meet a person. It turns out if you meet someone under conditions that are physiologically stirring you up, or if you meet them under conditions that are unusual, you're more likely to be attracted to that person. Years ago, we did a study where we wanted to test this. We arranged to have an attractive young woman stand in the middle of a scary suspension bridge. It's a 400-foot suspension bridge in Vancouver, just north of Vancouver, over a 100-foot ravine. It's a roaring river below. You're on the bridge, and the bridge shakes. And so every time a young man of the appropriate age and walking by himself would walk across the bridge, this young woman would stop him and say, excuse me, we're doing a study of creativity in beautiful places. Would you mind filling out a little questionnaire? And the men would all stop, of course. They weren't going to be willing to admit to this young woman they were too scared to, to stop on the bridge. And she'd give them a clipboard, and there was a little picture, and they were to make up a story about the picture. When she was done, when he was done filling it out, she'd say, thank you very much for being in the study. Uh, I can't tell you more about the study now, but if you want to know more about it, you can phone me tonight. And she'd write her first name on the edge of her little piece of paper, tear it off with her phone number, and hand it to the guy. She stopped 20 men like this on the bridge. She also stopped 20 men who were walking over another bridge in the same park that was a heavy cedar bridge over a dry rivulet. You could jump off and it wouldn't hurt you. Same procedure. What we then did is we looked at two things. We looked at how many men called her that night. Far more men who met her on the scary bridge phoned her that night than men who met this same woman on the safe bridge. We also looked at the stories they wrote. There was much more romantic and sexual content in the stories written on the scary bridge than on the safe bridge. One of the things the self-expansion model predicts is that you feel good when you're expanding, when you're rapidly growing from knowing less to knowing more, to having fewer to more perspectives. When you fall in love with someone, you're up all night talking, you're including the other and the self at a rapid rate, your life is expanding, but eventually you get to know them. They become part of you. You'd be really bad, sad to lose them, but you're no longer expanding. Life slows down with the partner and your interests go elsewhere. What could be done? Elaine Aaron, my collaborator, and my wife and I reason that one thing one might do is to do something exciting, challenging, self-expanding with your partner so that while you're no longer expanding from the relationship, you're expanding in the relationship. I think it's very important to have that attraction and just that spark and the love and the passion. Um, I think it's also um, even more important to know that, that there will be changes in your relationship to not always expect the same because I think I've seen other friends' relationships dissolve when all of a sudden that, that passion was gone, that just that quick and just every moment is amazing. Um, it turns into a steadier, deeper love and maybe not so crazy, but, um, but just as powerful.